Captain Blood, His Odyssey by Raphael Sabatini. Chapter 1. Peter Blood, bachelor of medicine and several other things besides, smoked a pipe and tended the geraniums boxed on the sill of his window above Water Lane in the town of Bridgewater. Sternly disapproving eyes considered him from a window opposite, but went disregarded. Mr. Blood's attention was divided between his task and the stream of humanity in the narrow street below, a stream which poured for the second time second time that day towards Castle Field, where, where earlier in the afternoon Ferguson, the Duke's chaplain, had preached a sermon containing more treason than divinity. These straggling, excited groups were mainly composed of men with green boughs in their hats and most the most ludicrous of weapons in their hands. Some, it is true, shouldered fowling pieces, and here and there a sword was brandished, but more of them were armed with clubs, and most of them trailed the mammoth pikes fashioned out of skies, scythes, as formidable to the eye as they were clumsy to the hand. There were weavers, brewers, carpenters, smiths, masons, bricklayers, cobblers, and representatives of every other trade of peace among these improvised men of war. Bridgewater, like Totten, had yielded so generously of its manhood to the service of the bastard duke that for any to abstain whose age and strength admitted of his bearing arms was to brand himself a coward or a pap papist. Yet Peter Blood, who was not able to bear who was not only able to bear arms but trained and skilled in their use who was certainly no coward and a papist only when it suited him tended his geraniums and smoked his pipe on that warm july evening as indifferently as if nothing were afoot one other thing he did he flung after those war fevered enthusiasts a line of horace a poet for whose work he had early conceived an inordinate, inordinate affection Quo quo Celsius Rutus. And now perhaps you guess why the hot, intrepid blood inherited from the roving sires of his Somerset mother remained cool amidst all this frenzied fanatical heat of rebellion, why the turbulent spirit which had forced him once from the sedate academical bonds his father would have imposed upon him should now remain quiet in the very midst of turbulence. You realize how he regarded these men who were rallying to the banners of liberty, the banners woven by the virgins of Taunton, the girls from the sem seminaries of Miss Blake and Mrs. Mrs. Musgrove, who, as the ballad runs, had ripped open their silk petticoats to make colors for King Mon Monmouth's army. That Latin line, contemptuously flung after them as they clattered down the cobbled street, revealed his mind. To him they were fools rushing in wicked frenzy upon their ruin. You see, he knew too much about this fellow Monmouth and the pretty brown slut who had borne him to be deceived by the legend of legitimacy on the strength of which this standard of rebellion had been raised. He had read the absurd procl proclamation posted at the cross at Bridgewater, as it had been posted also at Taunton and elsewhere, setting forth that upon the decease of our sovereign Lord Charles II, the right of succession up to the crown of England, Scotland, France, and Ireland, at, with the domin dominions and territories thereon to belonging, did legally descend and devolve upon the most illustrious and high-born Prince James, Duke of Monmouth son and heir apparent to the said King Charles the Second. And it moved him to laughter, as had the further announcement that James, Duke of York, did first cause the said late king to be poisoned, and immediately thereupon did usurp and invade the crown. He knew not which was the greater lie, for Mr. Blood had spent a third of his life in the Netherlands, where, this same James Scott, who now proclaimed himself James II, by the grace of God, King, etc., first saw the light some six and thirty years ago, and he was acquainted with the story current there, the story current there of the fellow's real paternity. Far from being legitimate, by virtue of a pretended secret marriage between Charles Stuart and Lucy Walter, it was possible that this Monmouth, who now proclaimed himself King of England, was not even the illegitimate child of the late sovereign, but what, what, but ruin and disaster could be the end of this grotesque pretension? How could it be hoped that England would ever swallow such a Perkin? And it was on his behalf, 
to uphold his fantastic claim that these West Country clods, led by a few Amergresque Whigs, had been seduced into rebellion. Quo, quo, Celsius Rutius. He laughed and sighed in one, but the laugh dominated the sigh, for Mr. Blood was unsympathetic, as are most self-sufficient men, and he was very self-sufficient. Adversity had taught him to be so. A more tender-hearted man, possessing his vision and his knowledge, might have found cause for tears in the con contemplation of these ardent, simple, nonconformist sheep going forth to the shambles, escorted to the rallying ground on Castle Field by wives and daughters, sweethearts and mothers, sustained by the delusion that they were taking the field in defense of right, of liberty, and of religion. For he knew, as all Bridgewater knew and had known now for some hours, that it was Monmouth's attention to deliver battle that same night. The Duke was to lead a surprise attack upon the Royalist army under Ferguson, that was now encamped on Sedgemoor. Mr. Blood assumed that Lord Feversham would be equally well informed, and if this assumption he if in this assumption he was wrong, at least he was justified of it. He was not to suppose the royalist commander so indifferently skilled in the trade he followed. Mr. Blood knocked the ashes from his pipe and drew back to close his window. As he did so, his glance traveling straight across the street met at last the glance of those hostile eyes that watched him. There were two pairs, and they belonged to the Mrs. Pitt, Mrs. Pitt, two amiable, sentimental maiden ladies who yielded to none in Bridgewater in their worship of the handsome Monmouth. Mr. Blood smiled and inclined his head, for he was on friendly terms with these ladies, one of whom, indeed, ha had been for a little while his patient. But there was no response to his greeting. Instead, the eyes gave him back a stare of cold disdain. The smile on his thin lips grew a little broader, a little less pleasant. He understood the reason of that hostility, which had been daily growing in this past week since Monmouth had come to turn the brains of, of women of all ages. The Mrs. Pitt, he apprehended, con, 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 contemned him that he, a young and vigorous man of a military training which might be now valuable to the cause, should stand aloof that he should placidly smoke his pipe and tend his geraniums on this evening of all evenings, when men of spirit were rallying to the Protestant champion, offering their blood to place him on the throne where he belonged. If Mr. Blood had condescended to debate the matter with these ladies, he might have urged that having had his fill of wandering and adventuring, he was now embarked upon a career for which he had been originally attended and for which his studies had equipped him that he was a man of medicine and not of war, a healer, not a slayer. But they would have answered him, he knew, that in such a cause it behooved every man who deemed himself a man to take up arms. They would have pointed out that their own nephew, Jeremiah, who was by trade a sailor, the master of a ship, which by an ill chance for that young man had come to anchor at this season in Bridgewater Bay, had quitted the helm to snatch up a musket in defense of right. But Mr. Blood was not of those who argue. As I have said, he was a self-sufficient man. He closed the window, drew the curtains, and turned to the pleasant candle-lighted room and the table on which Mr. Mrs. Barlow, his housekeeper, was in the very act of spreading supper. To her, however, he spoke aloud his thought. It's out of favor. It's out of favor I am with the vinegary virgins over the way. He had a pleasant, vibrant voice, whose metallic ring was softened and muted by the Irish accent in which his, all his wanderings he had never lost. It was a voice that could woo seductively and caressingly, or command in such a way as to compel obedience. Indeed, the man's whole nature was in that voice of his. For the rest of him, he was tall and spare, swarthy of tint as a gypsy, with eyes that were startlingly blue in that dark face and under those level black brows, in their glance those eyes, flanking a high-bridged, intrepid nose, were of singular penetration and of a steady haughtiness that went well with his firm lips. Though dressed in black as became his calling, yet it was with an elegance derived from the love of clothes that is peculiar to the adventurer he had been, rather than to, be, rather than to the staid Medicus he now was.' 
His coat was of fine camlet and was laced with silver. There were ruffles of Mechlin at his wrists and a Mechlin cravat encased his throat. His great black periwig was seduciously, sedulously uh, curled as any in at Whitehall. Seeing him thus and perceiving his real nature, which was plain upon him, you might have been tempted to speculate how long such a man would be content to lie by in this little backwater of the world into which chance had swept him some six months ago, how long he would continue to pursue the trade for which he had, he had qualified himself before he had begun to live. Difficult of belief though it may be when you know his history, previous and subsequent, yet it is possible that, that for a trick of that fate was about to play him, he might have continued this peaceful existence, settling down completely to the life of a doctor in this Somersetshire haven. It is possible, but not probable. He was the son of an Irish medicus, by, Somerset, by a Somerset lady in whose veins ran the rover blood of the Frobishers, which may account for a certain wildness that had early manifested itself in his disposition. This wildness had profoundly alarmed his father, who, for an Irishman, was of a singularly peace-loving nature. He had early resolved that the boy should follow his own honourable profession, and Peter Blood, being quick to learn and oddly greedy of knowledge, had satisfied his parent by receiving at the age of twenty the degree of Baccalaureus Medicani at the Trinity College, Dublin. His father survived that satisfaction by three months only. His mother had been dead some years already. Thus Peter Blood came into an inheritance of some few hundred pounds with which he had set out to see the world and give for a season a free rein to that restless spirit by which he was imbued. A set of curious chances led him to take service with the Dutch, then at war with France, and a predilection for the sea made him elect that this service should be upon that element. He had the advantage of a commission under the famous de Ruyter, and fought in the Mediterranean engagement in which that great Dutch admiral lost his life. After the peace of Nimegen, his movements are obscure, but we know that he spent two years in a Spanish prison, though we do not know how he contrived to get there. It may be due to this that upon his release he took his sword to France and saw service with the French in their warring upon the Spanish Netherlands. Having reached at last the age of thirty-two, his appetite for adventure surfeited, his health had, having grown indifferent as a result of his neglected wound, he was suddenly overwhelmed by homesickness. He took ship from Nantes with, the, with intent to cross to Ireland. But the vessel being driven by the stress of weather into Bridgewater Bay, and Blood's health having grown worse during the voyage, he decided to go ashore there, additionally urged to it by the fact that it was his mother's native soil. Thus, in January of that year, 1685, he had come to Bridgewater, possessor of a fortune that was approximately the same as that which he had originally set out from Dublin eleven years ago. Because he liked the place in which his health was rapidly restored to him, and because he conceived that he had passed through adventures enough for a man's lifetime, he determined to settle there and take up at last the profession of medicine from which he had, with so little profit, broken away. That is all his story, or so much as it matters of up to that night, six months later, when the Battle of Sedgemoor was fought. Deeming the impending action no affair of his, as indeed it was not, and indifferent to the activity with which Bridgewater was that night agog, Mr. Blood closed his ears to the sound of it, and went early to bed. He was peacefully asleep long before eleven o'clock, at which hour, as you know, Monmouth ro rode but with his rebel host along the Bristol Road, circuitously to avoid the marshland that lay directly between himself and the royal army. You also know that his numer numerical advantage, possibly counterbalanced by the greater steadiness of the regular troops on the other side, and the advantages he had derived from, fail from falling by surprise upon an army that was more or less asleep, were all lost to him by the blundering and bad leadership before ever he was at grips with Feversham. The armies came into conclusion in the neighborhood of two o'clock in the morning, Mr. Blood slept undisturbed through the distant booms of cannon, 
not until four o'clock, when the sun was rising to dispel the last wisps of mist over the stricken field of battle, did he awaken from his tranquil slumbers. He sat up in bed, rubbed the sleep from his eyes, and collected himself. Blows were thundering upon the door of his house, and a voice was calling incoherently. This was the noise that had aroused him, conceiving that it had he had to do with some urgent obstacle case, he reached for bedgown and slippers to go below. On the landing, he almost collided with Mrs. Barlow, newly risen and unsightly in a state of panic. He quieted her cluckings with a word of reassurance and went himself to open. There, in slanting golden light of the newly risen sun, stood a breathless, wild-eyed man and a steaming horse, Smothered in dust and grime, his clothes in disarray, the left sleeve of his doublet hanging in rags, this young man opened his lips to speak, yet for a long moment remained speechless. In that moment, Mr. Blood recognized him for the young shipmaster, Jeremiah Pitt, the nephew of the maiden ladies opposite, one who had been drawn by the general enthusiasm into the vortex of that rebellion. The street was rousing, awakened by the sailor, sailor's noisy advent, the doors were opening, and lattices were being unlaced for the protrusions of anxious, inquisitive heads. "'Take your time now,' said Mr. Blood. "'I never knew speed but made over by overhaste.' But the wild, wild-eyed wild lad paid no heed to the admonition. He plunged, plunged headlong into speech, gasping, breath, breathless. "'It's Lord Gild Gildroy,' he panted. "'He's so wounded at Oglethorpe's farm by the river.' I bore him thither, and he sent me for you. Come away, come away. He would have clutched the doctor and hailed him forth by force in bedgown and slippers as he was, but the doctor eluded that too eager hand. To be sure, I'll come, he said. He was distressed. Gild, Gild, Gildoy had been very friendly, generous patron to him since his settling in these parts and Mr. Blood was eager enough to do what he could now could to discharge the debt, grieving that the occasion should have risen, and in such a manner, for he knew quite well that the rash young nobleman had been an active agent of the Duke's. To be sure, I'll come, but first give me leave to get some clothes and other things that I may need. There's no time to lose. Be easy now. I'll lose none. I tell you again, you'll go quickest by going leisurely. Come in. Take a chair. He threw open the door of the parlor. Young Pitt waved aside the invitation. I'll wait here. Make haste in God's name. Mr. Blood went off to dress and to fetch a case of instruments. Questions concerning the precise nature of Lord Gildhoy, Gildoy's hurt could wait until they were on their way. Whilst he pulled on his boots, he gave Mrs. Barlow instructions for the day, which included the matter of a dinner he was not destined to eat. At last, when at last he went forth again, Mrs. Barlow clucking after him like a disgruntled fowl, he found young Pitt smothered in a crowd of scared, half-dressed townsfolk, mostly women, who had come hastening for news of how the battle had sped. The news he gave them was to be read in the lamentations in which they disturbed the morning air. At sight of the doctor, dressed and booted, the case of instruments tucked under his arm, the messenger disengaged himself from those who pressed about, shook off his weariness and the two tearful ants that clung most closely, and seized the bridle of his horse. He climbed to the saddle. "'Come along, sir,' he cried. "'Mount behind me!' Mr. Blood, without wasting words, did as he was bidden. Pitt touched the horse with his spur. The little crowd gave way, and thus upon the crupper of that doubly laden horse, clinging to the belt of his companion, Peter Blood set out upon his odyssey, for this pit, in which he beheld no more than the messenger of a wounded rebel gentleman, was indeed the very messenger of fate. End of chapter 1